Well, welcome to the webinar, everyone. Uh, the Social Science Research Institute's Consortium on Substance Use and Addiction and the Criminal Justice Research Center are very happy to welcome independent journalist and author Sam Quinones to give a presentation to us today. Uh, Sam is a former LA Times reporter and author of three acclaimed books, including Dreamland, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Best Nonfiction Book in 2015, and The Least of Us, which was recently nominated for the same award. Uh, he also serves as a freelance journalist for several outlets, including The Atlantic, Politico, and The New York Times. He's won numerous awards, far too many for me to mention here, uh, but what I want to encourage you is to visit his website which is www.samquinones.com. It gives uh, details about his very interesting background and links to many of his writings and interviews that he's given over the years. Um, he's going to talk for roughly 40 minutes and then open it up to questions. Uh, he said, as long as we're asking good questions, he'll stay in to answer them. So please uh, use the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, and uh, we'll have a moderator uh, to throw them out to him. Uh, so Sam, welcome to Penn State, uh, at least virtually. We're excited to hear your thoughts and we'll turn it over to you. Great, well, thanks very much, Paul. Thanks for getting in contact and, uh, and doing this. Um, um, I'm, I'm really happy to be with you all, um, even though truthfully, I'm, I'm kind of at a point where I could do without Zoom for a while. Um, it, sometimes it is the best option. So um, great to be with you guys. Um, uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, kind of my own uh, trajectory in this whole topic, and also what uh, I can, as I began to to, to uh, report on it, um, and, and the, the the stories I came up with, what what I began to find, and what that led me to believe is now necessary. Uh, what the, how the facts on the ground have changed so much, uh, particularly in the last several years, um, and that that what that means for us as a country and maybe people in public health, people in uh, social work, people in addiction, medicine, law enforcement, et, et, et cetera. Um, I do think it has a lot of, of uh, very important um, ramifications. And then at that point, I'm happy to, uh, don't wanna talk too, too long. I do wanna get to questions, a lot of questions, whatever you all have, it'd be fine with me. Um, so um, let me just start by saying though that um, uh, uh, these two books behind me are my books on the t on the topic of uh, the opioid epidemic, that drug addiction epidemic, really is what it is now in, across the country. Uh, the first one was Dreamland. Some of you may have may have read. Um, you know, um, I wrote Dreamland, published in two thousand fifteen and was exhausted by the end of it. I, I just, my little brain was just kind of depleted at that point. Um, and very short order though, my publisher began uh, suggesting I write another book on the topic. And um, I didn't want to uh, because I was exhausted, that's number one. Um, it had been a great saga, you know, personally and journalistically uh, uh, for me, but the other thing that happened was while writing it, I encountered this tremendous silence. It was a really remarkable thing to, to, to feel and, and see and encounter that the silence um, uh, of people who were affected by this, but nobody wanted to talk about it. It was the obituaries of fabrications. Everything was, was really, you know, there was this nationwide silence on the topic. It was a remarkable thing, one I did not expect um uh, uh to find there were only three lawsuits by the time i published this book uh against drug companies and i just imagined they would they would go nowhere no lawsuit was ever gonna function because no there was no you know awareness there was no there was a, a total uh silence I, the, the, the 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 my book dreamland had to use the um the the uh, um the subtitle of the book is true tale from america of america's opiate epidemic. The reason I used the word opiate was that nobody knew what an opioid was, right? Back then, if you think about it, it was 2014, 15. And so um, there was this, I just thought that the book would come out and fade and fail completely. I knew that it was about one of the great issues of our time. I'd been all over the country covering this and I, I just knew it. Um, it was rooted, I thought, in our own destruction of community or shredding of the bonds that kind of keep us together, the, 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 such an important bulwark of defense for us. And yet, you know, we kind of had gone about shredding it, you know. It was also seemed to me to be um, 
connected to our desire for, you know, easy answers, convenience, quick answers, solutions, silver bullet solutions to what are actually very, very significant, um, uh, complicated uh, problems. In this case, how do we solve solve pain as if there's a solution? And the solution we came up with was one pill for every every uh, human being. But I also thought that 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 that, that Dreamland said all that that I had to say because I was thinking old school, really, in all this, and I was thinking kind of like a an old crime reporter. I'm a crime reporter at heart, um, and and I thought, what could be worse than heroin? You know, literally, that's what I was thinking. You know, just because you write a book doesn't mean you can predict the future. You know what I mean? So, um, but then the book comes out in 2015, and to our complete amazement in our household, I began to get all these invitations come speak. And I was just blown away by it. It was just amazing to me that, that uh, anybody would want to. But so I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll come. Sure, no problem, you know. And what I also began to see is I, tra- I began to travel. And every year, the invitations multiplied. I could watch this thing. And so did the lawsuits. So by the end, by, by within a couple of years, there was 2,600, a few, few years after the book comes out, there's 2,600 lawsuits. I never imagined such a thing. All this awareness, people coming out of the shadows, wanting to share this. You begin to see this gradually to emerge. And I began to travel the country to all these different conferences, small towns, universities, uh, hospitals, you name it. It was just, it was a remarkable thing. In our family, we lived this night and day difference. It was remarkable certain that it would fail and then afterwards it was like stunning the new awareness that the book helped help provoke in vermont oklahoma hawaii or oregon i mean ohio and wisconsin you name it it was just north carolina it was just amazing to me and so i saw the country or rather i didn't see the country i saw all the conference halls and the hampton inns but what i really saw were the americans begin to f- come out of the shadows and that was a remarkable uh, thing what I was watching, I then um, on the road I began to see, you know, what comes after heroin, basically, and that's fentanyl, and that's because the trafficking world had discovered synthetic drugs, and that is the world we live in now, and we will live in, I believe, um, uh, for some time, because synthetic drugs don't are not. Uh, trafficked and pr- produced and trafficked because they they respond to a, a um, con- what consumers want. Synthetic drugs are, are produced and, con- and, and, and trafficked solely on the basis of what benefits traffickers, what's more in their, their interest in terms of lowering risk, increasing profit, easier to make the stuff. Synthetic drugs, of course, are drugs that don't need any plant, no, no plant involved. What are the benefits? There are many to a trafficking, uh, to the trafficking world. You don't need land, you don't need rain, farmers, you don't need fertilizer, you don't need anything that goes along with the land. And this is a major shift in the Mexican trafficking world because that world emerged, really the people who were part of it, who were the pioneers, they were all farmers or ranchers. They all had something to do with the land, but now 30, 40, 50 years later, really, uh, you're seeing this, this shift away from the land towards chemicals easy to make uh, these drugs you know you make it in a lab and you don't need to get away from the prying eyes of he- helicopters you don't rely on sea there's no more seasons anymore you make it all year round the only thing that matters now is the shipping ports land doesn't matter shipping ports matter because through shipping ports you can get all the chemicals the world market of world chemical markets available to you right and to me that was um, uh, what I began to see, I began to see this first, first, I, 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 as I got into this and began to understand these shifts began, I, I say, okay, fentanyl is the first thing. Actually, no, the thing that really taught the Mexican trafficking world about the benefits of, of synthetics was methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, they, 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 um, um, they learned how to make in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, they had labs in California and labs out of Mexico, and eventually law enforcement chased those labs out of California. They all located in, in Mexico where they had control of law enforcement, didn't face in many risks um, uh, from law enforcement, but it was making your own drugs. It, all of a sudden was this revelation to a lot of people, and there were certain fiefdoms guys who were kind of in control of that, who realized that why grow anything, you know? 
Um, they're still buying cocaine from the Colombians and so on, but why, you know, the, the, the future is in um, uh, synthetics and they industrialized the use of, of, of uh, the production of methamphetamine and they did so because it was very easy to make. It was very easy to make because it was made with one chemical, ephedrine, and ephedrine was a DEM decongestant, you know, very easy to make that into methamph methamphetamine. And they began to produce it in what were then known as super labs by, by the tens of pounds or dozens of pounds or hundreds of pounds at a time. They never were really able to cover more than they than, mo than parts of the Western United States because they could never get their hands on enough ephedrine uh, to be able to cover more than that, more than that. But they clearly saw the benefits back then. This is what taught them the great lesson that they that they later applied um, uh, 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 to fentanyl. Again, this was all about what benefited uh, traffickers, not not really so much um, consumers. Fentanyl, they discovered, the Sinaloa drug cartel discovered fentanyl, were the first ones in Mexico to discover this, in, in um, 2006. And it's a story I write about in, um, in, in The Least of Us, this book, which just came out in November. Uh, the early part of the book uh, talks about um, the amateur chemist who um, basically they hired to make ephedrine and he decided, no, I'm going to make fentanyl because he thought he was smarter than everybody. And they didn't understand fentanyl. He just says to them, look, um, if this is this drug that I'm making here is the most profitable um, uh, drug you have ever encountered in your in, in your careers. And um, and it, it will take a 50 to one cut, meaning one you make one kilo, you can make 50 kilos of saleable product on the street. Um, they, at first, they didn't believe that, but eventually he showed that it was true, and they were stunned. And um, but then he was arrested, and uh, I go into this all in the in the book. It's a long story. It's a fascinating, fascinating story of how one drug trafficking culture comes to understand that we don't need to raise grape, grow poppies anymore. We just make this stuff. You know, we get the ingredients, or we'll buy it straight from China. Early on, straight straight from China. Um, he gets arrested, and that means that they don't have that connection to making it anymore. And so as fentanyl then, though, a few years passed, but by 2013, 14, you begin to see fentanyl a growing awareness because now our opioid epidemic I wrote about in Dreamland has created this massive new population of addicted consumers. And also a lot of them are having trouble finding the pills that they that they once uh, relied on and getting addicted through prescription pain meds, as I'm sure you're all aware of. And um, that began to be a problem. A lot of people had already switched to heroin. Now you're seeing people understand that there's a synthetic form of heroin out there. It's called fentanyl. Um, and that, th that this drug can be made very easily. First people to begin to really send it over to the United States was uh, in, in large amounts were you know, Chinese chemical companies, but they were still sending it by the pound, a pound at a time, a kilo at a time, something like that, to people in the United States, dealers in the United States who had kind of gotten clued into this idea that fentanyl was the way to do it. Early on, because it was coming over to those folks, it was mixed. They didn't know what they were doing. This was the first time they saw lottery sized profits connected to their ability to market a drug that that is only market that that, that is uh, uh, so potent that only a few grains worth of say of salt uh, of this stuff would make you high and a couple more would kill you. And so the, the, the pot profit potential to this, they realized, was caught up in their ability to mix it. The problem is mix it with other chemicals, inert chemicals. The problem was that this doesn't, that they don't know how to do that. They're very bad at that in the first, the first uh, few years, if you remember, 14, 15, so you began to see these big, big, you know, numbers of, of overdoses in one area. And that's because they were mixing it. But they, a lot of them that go into this in the book, the myth was that the best pit place to mix uh, the best way to mix fentanyl was with um, a magic bullet blender. Those blenders you buy at Target for like twenty nine ninety five, you know those things. Uh, that became what, but narcotics agents began to see at these drug sites every time they bust them. All these little magic bullet blenders because they were mixing fentanyl with this other powder, or it was other. It was kind of coffee grinders. Well, whatever the case, it was really bad. 
<laughs> way to mix fentanyl. That was the way this was this was going um, uh, early, early, early on. Um, fentanyl became, as they say on the street, fentanyl changed everything. Changed every every part of the drug world, drug use, drug addiction, treatment, drug uh, profits. It changed. It democratized uh, uh, drug trafficking. Now you didn't need to be part of a cartel. You could just get your your dope from your your chemicals on the on the dark dark web, where you get your fentanyl on the on the dark on, on the dark web. Um, it created kingpins out of people who had no business being kingpins in the drug world. They were completely unprepared for it. They didn't know what they were doing, but they were selling like multi-kilo loads. These were kilo uh, kingpin-like quantities. And, and a lot of them also went to prison for kingpin-like prison sentences. Um, it began to spread mainly what, what, what then began to happen as, the, as this, as, as this uh, em, em, emerged as the thing is that they figured out how, finally again how to make it in Mexico and at that point, uh, the Chinese government kind of cut down on the, on the ability of the trafficking world to get access to, uh, uh, to well, to, to fentanyl. The, the chemical companies in, in, in China were were, were uh, uh, um, it, was, it was very difficult. They, they made it very difficult for them to make it. They they didn't, however, regulate how much of the the chem, of the ingredients they could they could get in their hands on. And so the the chemical companies began sell, selling those ingredients. Through those same shipping ports I talked about, to the traffickers in Mexico, and they began um, uh, they began uh, uh, to make it. They begin. That's what really begins to change everything. Beginning in about 2017, they figure out how to make this stuff, and because they can get access to world chemical markets through those the shipping ports on the on the Pacific coast of Mexico, they then are able to make fentanyl in quantities that are simply staggering okay simply nothing like we've we've ever seen and so you begin to see um fentanyl all over the country which is where it is essentially now beginning in about 2017 and 18 you begin to see it just now reach to every place starts in the first places were in of course the states most affected by the opioid epidemic west you know west virginia ohio kentucky etc those states but now it's it's everywhere and it's been there since about 2018 in california where i'm from it didn't arrive till about 2018 but now it's all over it's all over um uh, 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 California. It's down down in Mexico. They change everything by by transforming uh, by printing out, pressing out uh, counterfeit pills that look every bit like a Percocet, Adderall, uh, uh, Xanax bar, Lor Norco's, Lortaz, whatever it is, um, oxycodone generic thirty milligrams. That's a big one. That was really the first one. Um, it, it all of this has to do with supply. This is a supply. Uh, story in in my uh, opinion, after doing a research on this and reporting on this for so long, um, they they begin to put fentanyl into those counterfeit pills. They're looking for a way of marketing the pills to Americans who love their pills. You got a lot of people addicted to pills; they can't find them as easily anymore, the legitimate ones. And so they come up with the idea: let's just market the pills. And it starts out a few hundred thousand. You know, the first seizures were were 10,000 at the border, 12,000, 18,000, 30,000. In November, last November, they had a house in Scottsdale, Arizona, where they seized 1.7 million, just one little house uh, of these pills. So th these pills are now being marketed in, in just like tens of millions, in my opinion, all across the country. All of them look very, very much like the real pills that they're designed to replicate. And in fact, they're all counterfeit and they all contain nothing but 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 fentanyl um, and, and, uh, and meanwhile fentanyl is being laced into cocaine uh, into methamphetamine and for very good reason if you're a drug drug dealer again this is all about traffickers it's all about drug dealers um, if you sell cocaine people buy from you every week maybe every couple of weeks whatever they they don't buy from you Abbott most people don't buy from you every single day but if you put fentanyl into cocaine eventually and that person doesn't die eventually that person is going to become an opioid addict and that person will be buying from you every single day it's a market expansion tool you have more customers when you add fentanyl to eventually 
Uh, you do kill some people along the way. On the other hand, if in the in, if you're dealing with a world in which the uh, everyone is more or less addicted to fentanyl, which is what now definitely what you're finding, a, a death here and there does not create a problem. It's it's in that world of the you know a death is a is an advertisement. It's not a warning. And so you have that going on and you see this now pretty much across the country you saw those west point cadets in florida using what they thought was hair was cocaine and several of them fall out and then to to overdose because they were given cpr to their friends who would who are who are now uh, overdosing themselves i mean you begin to see this this all over the country. It's again transformed. Every family transforms everything because it is so prevalent. The supply is so vast, so cheap, so profitable um, that it just transforms all. The, it 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 makes it is the perfect drug for a drug dealer and the biggest curse for a, a drug user. That's because fentanyl is actually a magnificent drug in 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 surgery and in, in the medical world and has transformed surgery many many years ago in the 60s when it first came out the reason it does, one of the reasons it does that is because it takes you in and out of anesthesia very very quickly uh so very soon after your operation you're very coherent i was given fentanyl after a cardiac uh, a heart attack and i it just you know it was a uh, uh very quickly it it, it uh, brought me out and i was lucid and coherent unlike with morphine i would have been kind of doped up for a long time when it's in the hand it's a magnificent drug when it's in in, in, sur in surgery when it's in the hands of the underworld is a disaster and and what fentanyl does for it to to users to people particularly who are you know heroin users who have been transformed into fentanyl users they go from using heroin maybe twice a day but now with fentanyl, they have to use it far more often because it goes in and out very quickly. So very quickly, within four or five hours, you're feeling once of using fentanyl, you're feeling the dope sickness way you have to use again, which means it's every day you're ex engaging in a game of Russian roulette because you, there's no way of con of 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 um, of uh, making sure that you have a consistently good mix of the stuff on the street. The, the mix are all over the, the map, as, as, as you can imagine. And so, so the folks who are who are using it have to use more often. Of course, this is a curse for them. You know, they have to. Use, they're always being reminded of the dope sickness every few hours. Oh my God, I got to use again. Got to use again. I've talked to people who are actually using six, seven, eight times in 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 a day, depending on their on their tolerance. Of course, if you're a dealer, of course that's magnificent. You got to get these people have to buy from you all the time. So there's this there's this clear idea that this is a supply story about supply creating demand. It's in the cocaine now. It's creating new demand that didn't exist before. It's in the it's it's creating new demand because you have to use it constantly, right? And uh, to keep the dope sickness away if you're if you're uh, addicted to it. Um, <clears throat> and so that is kind of there's a whole lot more to the fentanyl story, but you know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, um, I would say the methamphetamine the story is different. The story is um but but similar so much of it is now being able to be made because they switched how they made methamphetamine down in mexico there's a new method the federal was heavily regulated in 2008 by 2009 the trafficking world is switching to a new method using the precursor p2p p2p is, has no benefits over the ephedrine method except except that you can make p2p many many very diff different ways with all of these very common industrial chemicals widely available very cheap very legal very toxic you make it p2p this way the government cracks down on those chemicals you switch to a, met one of the many other ways and so what this allows them to do if they control ports they then control the amount of chemicals they can get, they then can make the uh, um, just, again, staggering quantities of, chem of, of methamphetamine, which is exactly what we are seeing uh, today. And I'm sure in, in, uh, in, in your areas and uh, many parts of the country, the, the, the remarkable thing is that they are, uh, the trafficking world is now able to sell, to, to cover the country in not one, but two drugs. That's never happened before one generalized area the western side of mexico is now covering the entire united states with two drugs again never happened before that one group has done that 
Um, methamphetamine begins to really amp up in production beginning in 2013, hits the West Coast by 2017 and 18, it's in the Midwest, and in 2019, it's, by, it's up into New England, where it never uh, uh, was before. There's never really any meth up there. The price, meanwhile, collapses. I'm, in, I'm living in Nashville at the moment. Um, uh, we uh, in Nashville, we saw uh, uh, five years ago, the price was $19,000 for a pound of methamphetamine. Now it's 3000. It's 80% drop of roughly in price. You're seeing 80% drop in price all over the, the country. It's a remarkable thing. But you know, there's another story that makes this methamphetamine so um, uh, uh, e even doubly important. Um, and that is that along the way, according to my reporting, talking with people who are homeless outreach folks, drug counselors, ER docs, on and on, a lot of different people who work in this every day, what they are reporting to me is that this meth is accompanied by very quick, very rapid onset symptoms of mental illness very intense paranoia. It's not like the ephedrine meth that was a kind of a party drug. And eventually after staying up for four or five days, you begin to see shadows that aren't there and that kind of thing. This very quickly uh, plunges people into mental, into mental you know, psycho, meth induced psychosis is rampant now. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's creating homelessness. People can't live with people who are shrieking at demons at three in the morning or, or certain that there's a, a, a government um, a camera inside the TV or, you know, or that the, the, their roommates trying to poison them or their parents are trying to poison them or something like this. And so what you're beginning to see as this meth marches across the country, you begin to see enormous increases in mental illness, homelessness, and then also tent encampments all across uh, the, the country. Um, tent encampments become the perfect place for people who are suffering from this um, uh, uh, psychosis because a tent is a perfect place for you to kind of hide from the world that you believe is not threatening you everywhere. The last place you want to be is in a homeless shelter because that's you have to be face to face with all these people who are very scary and you're thinking everyone's out of their out of their minds. The other thing about about methamphetamine that I would say is probably similarly true to 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 fentanyl. Of course, these both of drugs are found in these tent encampments rampantly. It's a multi, it's a poly drug world we're in now. Of course, as you know, probably. Um, but one of the things that is also characteristic, I would say, especially of methamphetamine, is that people do not want to leave to get treatment. Doesn't matter how cold the winter is. I was up just up in um, in uh, uh, um, uh, uh, southern Indiana speaking with an ER doc, and he said a year ago we had a very mild winter, yet we had a tenfold increase in frostbite cases in my ER because people in the tent encampments did not want to leave, no matter how cold or what, no matter how bad it got, they weren't gonna gonna leave. A week before I was there, a woman froze to death. So you are seeing th these two drugs fundamentally change so much about drug first of all the longer people are on the street we have about 10 more minutes i'm going to try to end up here and then we could talk talk more um any questions you guys might have um the longer you are on the street the more chance that one fentanyl will kill you because there is no such thing as a long-term fentanyl street drug user it's not gonna happen you just will die and um, if you relapse, you will die very quickly because you don't have the tolerance. And this is an extraordinarily potent um, uh, drug. Um, and, and, and longer you are on the street, the more chance you will, go, you will be rendered raving mad from the, the, the methamphetamine that's, that's out there. And that you'll end up, um, if you, regardless of how you became homeless, methamphetamine makes it almost certainty that you will remain so. You will resist treatment. You will never, you know, you will be incapable of living with other, with other, other, other people. Uh, and very often too, I should, should very often people are reporting that the, the, the patients or the clients that they see um, who come in off the street on, a, on like this um, very often are, are um, not uh, at all able, they, they have deep, uh, a brain damage, what looks to be very severe brain damage that takes months, maybe years, maybe never uh, able to return 
to uh, to baseline, as as folks say, and to to where they were before they started using this. This means that treatment, um, our approaches, it seems to me, need to be radically revised. Waiting for people to be ready for treatment, take kind of some some epiphany, like I'm I'm I'm, I'm done now. You know, okay, yeah, I'm done with this. I'm I'm, I'm I want to I want my treatment bed. That's not going to happen. That will not help people to die long before they ever develop any kind of readiness for treatment. People will on meth. Meth not only makes you will make you homeless. It will also make homelessness possible to endure by divorce, divorcing you from reality. So people who are in that that psychotic state, they're never going to. So we have to find ways of, of not waiting for people to be ready. I think that was a myth anyway, not a myth, but it was it was more appropriate to like the alcoholic uh, uh, treatment, uh, the alcoholic process of, of, of coming to treatment. It's like I'm ready now. I've worn out my family, et cetera. That's not what we're dealing with anymore on the, on, on the streets. We have to be in, I, th I believe, in the business of forcing people into treatment. And that is why I say I believe there's now this is calling out for a mix a, a, a blend of of law enforcement and uh, and and harm reduction together. You cannot affect change in people without both. It, it, it seems to me now I know this is kind of anathema to a lot of people we we've, we've been through this kind of idea of decriminalizing drugs and harm reduction this kind of thing. And, and you know, and it went well law enforcement didn't work because the drug war, you know, failed and so the drug war to the extent it failed and i'd be willing to argue some points on that, but to the extent it failed it caused a lot of damage that was unnecessary it was because not because we use law enforcement. It's because we only use law enforcement. Remember, this was the same. The same thing happened with the pain, with the prescription pain pills. Pills. How do you want to treat a very complicated problem originating in the central nervous system with one pill? You know. Well, well, of course. Then there's all kinds of unintended consequences. Well, the same was true with using only law enforcement to address the drug addiction problem in in this country. We need to address it multidisciplinarily. The same way now they're learning that. It, they always should have done with with pain in, in, in among pain uh, specialists. And and so I think and so what but what this means is I think two two things are become there are many things we could talk about, I think, but right now, let me just talk about two they're I think very, very important. One is we absolutely need to rethink jail. Jail in this country is being rethought. There are many counties in the area redoing it, reimagining something different, a place for recovery to begin. It's a radical idea because jail has never been a, seen as a place. It's been a, play, a dumping ground, a veget, place to vegetate, right? You sit there and watch Judge Judy all day long and play poker and dream of your next big score when you get about on, uh, on the street. For addicts, it's a complete waste of time. It's a, the worst than a waste of time. So it's, it's a loss of great opportunity because people are on the street obeying the dope, then they get arrested, then they get going to detox and for in many, many counties all across this country for decades, we plunge them into a place where it's just boring beyond words, tedious or predatory, but never was it positive. Now you're finding counties who are saying, no, we can find a way of making jail a place for recovery to begin, a place where you can get signed up for Medicaid. So when you leave, you have health insurance. This is what's happening in, in, in three chapters in the least of us that talk about a county in North, Northern Kentucky that's doing exactly that. What this allows us to do is what I believe we need to be in the process, in the business of doing, and that is getting back to arrest people for small amounts of drugs, small amounts of, of, uh, of um, uh, 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 you know, paraphernalia, stolen property, not with the idea of sending people to prison for that, but with an idea of getting them off the street. This is harm reduction. You're, you're about, if you're about harm reduction, you got to be about getting people away from the harm. And the longer they're on the street, the more chance they are going to die. We need to get them off and jail has to be an option. So, it has been an option for a lot of people. I've met too many people to ignore who said the best day of my life was when I was arrested because I'd be dead otherwise. But the truth is also that the jail has never really been uh, a great place for folks, and it's particularly who are in drug addiction. And so it seems to me that we need to start making use of that, and that is happening across the country. But it just needs to happen more and more and more. And we need to get into the, beyond the idea that, you know, the, one of the great, great 
tragedies of COVID was that it came along just at the time when we were, um, when the drug trafficking world had covered the entire country with these two most damaging drugs we've ever seen on our street. And we began to believe there was a good idea to decriminalize drug sale and drug use at the very moment when those when those drugs were fentanyl and, and methamphetamine. To me, it's a, it's it's delusional to think that it's a good idea to it's a good idea to decriminalize the small possession of fentanyl and the small and the small sale of, of fentanyl. fentanyl selling fentanyl is every bit like firing a gun into a into a, a, a crowd. There's there's every chance that you will harm somebody and very likely you'll kill somebody. Um, and so to me, it feels like attempted murder, manslaughter or something uh, of, of the kind. But mostly what it does is it, it allows people to stay on the street. If you don't arrest, it allows people to stay on the street where they're going to die or they're going to grow, go stark raving mad. The other part to uh, what is all of this is calling on us to do is to use far greater use of drug court. Now, drug courts have been all across the country and they've been changing in a lot of different ways that I find very interesting, fascinating to watch a drug court, magnificent to watch a drug court, to watch a judge who knows all about the, the clients in front of them, just incredible. And to watch probation behave almost like as an ally to the person. See, how can we move you towards, not that you come in ready for treatment. That's, that's a, again, a myth, I think, particularly when it comes to these harder drugs. Rather, we're going to nudge you over months to embrace sobriety. That is the essential thing. But in order to do that, you need to leverage the power, the insistence of law enforcement. You need that jail to be able to start that process. You need the judge to be able to say, you don't do this, you're going someplace else. And now you've been detoxed, you're thinking more clearly, that matters to you. It didn't matter to you when you were on the street. So all these laws that we've been passing, like Prop 47 in California is one example, turning felony possession into misdemeanors, turning misdemeanors into nothing at all, um, really uh, effectively in a sense. Uh, is it comes come along just as the drugs on the street are changing and we're applying old ideas to those those very, very new, very damaging, very, very uh, disastrous drugs. Um, so uh, kind of run out of time here. There's a whole lot more to say. Um, I would just say that given the fact that the drugs of abuse on the street, this is the remarkable thing about neuroscience. Um, didn't even get a chance really to talk much about that, but we, we can if you like. Uh, the neuroscience shows that these drugs of abuse take these most basic, important, essential impulses towards self-preservation, and they hijack them and divert them and towards the, the obedience, complete obedience to finding and using more, more, more drugs. It's a remarkable idea. Millions of years of, of, of evolution have, have resulted in, in these, our brains that have kept us alive, all the ways that kept, brains have kept us alive through wanting, you know, giving us good feelings when we eat or have sex or when we are in community, you know, with other people. That's not a, a nice thing. That's an essential Thing. That's how we survived. Would people die in isolation today and in the caveman days? You know what I mean? So all of this, the, the, the drugs of abuse thwart all of that. They, thwart, they tell us to obey the dope even in the middle of winter. Stay out in the middle of winter and it's fine. You know, that kind of thing. Um, because these, and these drugs, this happens when drugs are, are the more potent they are and the more prevalent they are the more you will find that these drugs are uh, do this, right? That's, the, that's the, the potency and the prevalence, how cheap and available, et cetera, it, it is, is how this stuff happens. And because we have now drugs on the street that are the most potent, the most prevalent, cheap, uh, and laced into everything, apparently, that's, the drugs have changed. Our thinking has to as well. We ha it, it hasn't. We've tried to apply ideas that seem like good ideas 10, 15, 20 years ago to a, a, a new reality that is the, in, in which those old ideas are creating more devastation, in my opinion. Um, not a popular idea, I know, but I have to say, I think it, it, it fits exactly with the facts on the ground uh, today. 
that we need to be in the business of forcing people into treatment, nudging them, gradually pushing them in a certain direction, because to say otherwise, to do otherwise is to just in a recipe for death. On the streets today, rock bottom is death, okay? Um, there's a whole lot more hopeful stuff to what I've written than what I just said, but but uh, we're out of time. And so I, uh, for me to talk, but we, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions y'all might have, any, any critiques, um, any thoughts, anything like that, uh, feel free uh, to, to, to chime in and we can uh, have a, hopefully another kind of robust discussion on this. Well, thank you. I'll let you maybe uh, take a sip of water and, and catch your breath. I really mm -hmm. appreciate the talk so far. I'll try to moderate some of these questions um, and certainly yeah. encourage folks to continue sending these in. Um, it looks like a number of these, have, I think, are focusing somewhat on the on the policy side, particularly about prevention uh, and treatments. So maybe want you know to start with maybe you know in your work, have you come across or gotten insights into on the prevention side? You know anything that you've seen that is particularly effective? Um, you know, I always believe that prevention is a long term thing. It's not something we just do right now. Um, I believe that prevention one thing we need to do is involve all our neuroscientists in 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 or at least what they have learned in high school start teaching kids early about how their brain works we can teach them this there's vivid images and photos and, and so on uh, that will show kids and, and you can do these kinds of experiments on children on kids themselves on how does your brain uh, 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 what does your brain look like on storytelling, on prayer, on coffee, on, you know, on and on and on. And I think it's time to start doing that. I think once you see how your brain reacts to stuff like that's relatively, you know, positive in their lives and, and how that reacts on hyperpotent pot, for example, um, to me, that's a, that's a benefit. Um, you know, it's, it's, teaching kids too, I think in those in those classes um, about the immense power of the marketing a big part of the, of the book of the least of us deals with the the, the neuroscience of, of legal addictive substances and stuff and, and services and and to me that's a, another big thing we need to talk about how you know health, a health class, in my opinion, ought to deal with, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, uh, twice, uh, you know, for sophomores and seniors, let's say in high school, uh, six or eight weeks each year uh, on how the brain works and another four on how marketing uh, crap to people works, you know, um, how that those, those, you know, those big pornographic burgers that you see pushed into your face on TV and the the pizza with gooey, you know, which apparently is Elmer's glue, I guess. I don't know. That's what I hear. Uh, you know, th that kind of stuff. All of that is like all, you know, why don't why don't fast food places uh, change their logos ever? It's because those logos are triggers, man. They're like telling us, please come obey your impulse. I think once we do a lot of that, that that's like long term stuff, but I think it's very, very important to educate and giving kids the tools. Now, adolescence is a gateway itself is a gateway to drug use because it, it may also mean that we begin to rethink what the age of consent is, you know, to, to drink and smoke pot ought to be 25. That's when the, the, the prefrontal cortex is, is finished uh, uh, developing, you know, or maybe maybe 18 is embarrassingly soon in the life of somebody to be using this stuff and uh, even 21 um you know there's there's those kinds of things i think um i i think a lot of it just frankly has to do with doing things that strengthen families um you know families in dysfunction the the and trauma of various kinds we could go into you know they're so prone to this kind of problem um it's not the only Thing that creates it but but it certainly is a, a common a, 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 a common thing and i also feel that perhaps a community feel in this in the neighborhood locally in you know where you where people are spending more time outside get outside 
get with other Americans, be away from the screens, be doing stuff that people work together. I'm reading a book called, uh, oh, I don't have it here, but on, in praise of, um, of walking, it's called. Walking is a magnificent, a, it, it, a physical exercise is the best medicine we have for almost anything. You know, the more we do that, the more we do that together, uh, to me, it feels like a preventative measure in the long in the long run. But these are things that need to be thought of. Prevention is is thought of as like, well, let's teach them not to do drugs. I think that there are these other things, you know, teaching them about how they're being manipulated by marketing. Um, that kind of stuff is also part of, of the mix, it seems to me, about how our brains work. The more we understand that, the more we understand how we can be free Americans again. You know, changing how we live exam. That's what the, all of this is about, in my opinion, is really calling us to rethink how we live, what we consume, how much exercise we get, where we get our news on and on and on and on. It's all part of this, this kind of perversion of all the ways that we prospered, the human species is meant to prosper. We've kind of stifled it or squelched it or muted it. And, and instead we're now all alone and, and eating crap and listening to crap and sitting and for hours and hours and hours. All of this is about prevention, it seems to me. And it's also very, very healthy. It's about healthy neighborhoods, healthy towns as well. Great, thanks. Um... Maybe a, a somewhat related question is, what are your thoughts on, you know, having available, uh, you, you know, drugs that are maybe sort of, uh, uh, you know, you're talking about the potency of, of fentanyl and, and, and methamphetamine, but sort of uh, for those that might be experimenting, you know, that, uh, drugs that are sort of not necessarily quite as pot potent. Um, and then a, maybe a related question, you know, thoughts on how, you know, we're sort of seeing, you know, including in state college, the rise of, of head shops and vape shops. So I guess thinking a little bit about, about these, these other substances that are, you know, less potent, what's your, what I mean, are your thoughts we, we already that? have those substances out there. It's called sugar. It's called fat and sugar in the same massive frappuccino, right? I mean, I don't know what other drugs people would have imagined, uh, we're, it's called gambling. It's called, you know, endless shopping. I don't know. I mean, to me, it feels like we are, that's part of the problem that we are in a, in a culture that is drenched, just drenched in addictive crap. Unlike, unlike even 20 years ago, you know, and within our lifetimes, this has happened, you know? Um, and so it seems to me that, that, that the idea that we want to legalize more drugs and make more things more readily available that are hyper potent stuff that are going to be twisting our brain chemistry around. Um, I don't know. I just, I think all of this is, is connected. You know, the Sinaloa drug cartel, it's out here on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, the continuum, but it starts, that continuum starts with the, with the guy who invented chicken nuggets and and the uh, and the pornographer and the and the casino in, uh, designer and a Facebook software engineer and the sugar manufacturer the soft drink manufacturer and then boom 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 and you get you get smartphones and all the rest and then way out here is Chapo Guzman on the Sinaloa drug cartel, but it's the same continuum of manipulating. Our brain, our brain chemistry and our reward pathways, the limbic system of our brain, the central nervous system, of everybody is trying to figure out, and they're doing an excellent job of it, how to make products that will blast those areas. That's what chicken nuggets are, right? Like crack, just like crack, basically crack, okay? Think of chicken nuggets as crack, okay? And, and you know, it's like trying to manipulate those, and then not just manipulate them, but in the case of the legally available stuff, um, to market them endlessly, relentlessly, constantly. Every I've been watching uh, the the NCAA tournament. Oh my God! It's like every 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 ad is that you know Pete. Nobody else pizzas the hut, you know, and and big juicy pornographic burgers that like busting out of their buns, looking like they those burgers look like they just are about to have sex, you know. I mean, it's just incredible, like grow oozing fat and all this kind of stuff all of that is done with an absolute purpose of manipulating our 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 brain chemistry you know and um and so i don't know that we need more drugs in this consumer society that we have 
I, I have a very, very, um, I, I, I do have a very dim view of the prospects of in America, us being able to legalize any drug well, because we have no ability, no desire uh, for the kind of government regulation that would be required to make a legal drug a successful legal drug. Other countries have a different culture with regard to this. We do not. We, I, I just really don't, I doubt our ability to be able uh, to do that. American capitalism is too powerful. Um, we're the only ones, except for what some other country in New Zealand, I think that allows those damn uh, ads that on, uh, 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 you know, pharmacy drug ads about the four hour erections and all that crap. You know, we don't have, we don't have the ability to control. If you think about, think about alcohol, we've kind of more or less done that well, but still, you know, it's the drug that kills, you know, it's more deadly. It's, it's the drug that drops and more people in jail than any other, other drug. What we're trying to do with marijuana is a complete disaster. We need some kind of regulation that is across the board. Obviously a federal law would, would, would do that, but drastically regulating these companies in ways that every, you know, pot user would uh, rebel against, you know, um, lower potency. The pot world today seems very much like alcohol pre-prohibition to me. It's like almost anything goes and kids drinking, no problem. We got gummy bears for you now. It's not, no, no glass of beer for seven year old, but you got a gummy bear now. So what's the difference, you know, kind of thing. I just think we're mangling that that massively. It's a it's a disgrace what's happening with marijuana right now. Uh, again, a, a good solid federal law would do that. So I, I'm not sure that I see the point to more drugs in the American culture. We got so many. Watch TV during March Madness, and you will see it. You know, you got those damn gambling ads. If it's not Pizza the Hut, out Pizza the Hut, it's some damn gambling ad. I, I, take it. Take a a piece of paper and check do a check mark beside the like the ads you will see in an hour of advertising on 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 the ncaa tournament i bet three quarters of them are are are, are basically drug trafficker ads um maybe w w what are your thoughts on you know i think the the maybe the image or the stereotype in some ways you know in, in sort of public views in terms of who who a typical user is you know certainly you know, I think there's an idea that that sort of, to some extent, the white or rural users is kind of what spurred some of the increased interest in in opioid opioid yeah. you know interest. Maybe thoughts on 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 that and just sort of broader thinking about about these sort of maybe oh, I, differing I views of, of of users. Yeah, I would say that with Dreamland, um, that was the book that really you know talked about the pain pill prescribing. Uh, again, a, a, a problem that begins with legal drugs, okay? They're, they're very important to re remind people of that always. Um, and, and, um, and what was striking about that was that it was an almost entirely a white phenomenon. Uh, Native Americans were affected too, uh, to a significant degree, uh, but it was really just so, such a white issue. Um, and, and, and crossing all economic spectrum, you know, the Appalachia to Orange County, California and Fort Lauderdale and on and on and on. But it was white people almost entirely. And of course, it was uh, that broke with a lot of stigma or, or a lot of a lot of uh, ideas. You know, it was the it was the it was the high school quarterback and the cheerleader and it was the pastor's son and the, the judge's brother. And, and you know, it was like everybody. You know, it was a suburban house mom and that kind of thing. And um, all of that was, uh, you know, it, it was a, a startling thing for America to see. Um, I would say with fentanyl, fentanyl again changes everything and meth too. And you are now seeing the involvement, well, with meth, at least in LA where I've been from, meth has been part of the Latino community for many, many years. It's been, been a long, long time and been a devastating uh, thing, even when it was a Fedron uh, um, meth, even before the current stuff. But um, with the spread of methamphetamine, you are now seeing African Americans get involved in meth. I've never seen that before. That was that was what got me interested in that. When on earth, I mean, 35 years as a crime report, I never once found any African Americans who bought, 
used or even knew anything about methamphetamine. It was a white drug. It was going to a Latino drug. Um, and now with the spread of the stuff, it's, it's a black drug too. Fentanyl is now killing uh, black Americans for the first time in the opioid epidemic. Um, and that's because it's being laced into cocaine in the, in the black community. Uh, the drug of choice among drug users is uh, frequently uh, uh, cocaine. Uh, dealers in that community figured out, I, we just add fentanyl and pretty soon we got a, a new addict. Uh, of course, a lot of people die along the way when that happens. And that's what's been going on there. So you, you begin to see the spread. What's fascinating to me is that we used to find too, we used to find drug use was kind of regional and they, every region had its own store drug story, you might say, right? But, you know, if you go across the, the, the country on the interstates, you will see the same corporate uh, uh, proliferation, right? So you see the same commercial offerings, the same Hampton Inns, Motel 6, you'll see the same uh, Burger Kings, you'll see the same Speedway gas stations or whatever it happens to be. The same now, the trafficking world has done the same with dope. You see the same essential story in LA, and Phoenix, as you see in Oklahoma, as you see in Vermont, as you see, there's some, some variation still, but by and large, the homogenization of the, of the drug world has just been um, uh, 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 remarkable, uh, uh, it seems to me. So you see the same story over and over. And so you saw the, the, uh, the, 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 the cadets and all, uh, do, you know, uh, passing out. Uh, you saw Michael, um, Michael K. Williams, great actor who died, uh, who was uh, uh, fa fabulously uh, Omar in, in The Wire, my favorite show of all time. Um, he, he died of the same thing, right? And all, over and over, you see this all, it's the same story. It doesn't matter where it's happening, to whom, to what race, to what ethnic background or what, what economic class, it's the same, same story. And you're finding that with, with methamphetamine to a great degree now because meth is pretty much all over the country uh, as well. Great, thanks. Maybe kind of a, a two-part question. You, you, you know, you had talked some about how to incorporate treatment uh, into jails and the criminal justice system. So maybe the two-part question would be, you know, what are ways to, to better uh, integrate, you know, treatment into that setting? And also, how do, we, how do we be mindful of the fact that, you know, once someone has entered the criminal justice system, you know, that's in some ways, you know, uh, that might have broader impacts in terms of, you know, jobs or other things in terms of the well, transition the, back. That's, that's where the drug court comes in. Drug courts and jail work, work hand in glove. Again, if you're blending harm reduction, you're blending law enforcement and harm reduction, has to happen. That's the only way, it seems to me, at that point that we make an, a, make an, a, 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 that you can have an effect. Uh, drug courts are there to make sure that you work through it and through that you expunge or you lower or whatever, you, you, you have some effect on your, on your criminal record. That's the point of drug court, um, uh, but you have to be accountable too. You have to be there. You have to be working towards that. And um, I would say that if you want, I mean, you could read my book. There's there's three chapters that talk about uh, in in some depth about all the ways in which they have transformed these pods. There's a few pods in this one jail in Kenton County in Kentucky. And I'm just saying this is just one example, right? It seems to be seems to be interestingly enough seems to be in Kentucky where this is being tried more often. And I believe that's because in Kentucky, we, um, they elect their jailers and jailers who are elected are far, far more effective and far more accountable than say a sheriff who runs the thing and has a captain who's like a, an appointee who may or may not care about jail at all running the thing jail's too important what this opioid epidemic this addiction epidemic is showing jail is too too important for us to leave to an appointee somebody who may care or may not care you have to have someone whose life work is this this is like the passion and you can and when you do that i think when you begin to institute the kinds of things that they're doing in kenton county and other places you can see how jail becomes all of a sudden this po can become a positive not a panacea, not a cure-all. There's a lot more that needs to be done, but it's it's simply a way of saying this is a community response, one step towards a larger idea that there's a community response to addiction treatment 
than simply that we've been doing in 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 the past. So a few things they do. You know, you wake up at eight in the morning, you make your bed military style. The rest of the day is spent in classes. Most of the day in in the other pods that are not like this. You're watching Judge Judy all day long. Now now you're you're in classes. You're taking GED classes. There's inmate run um, uh, 12 step meetings, there's uh, time for exercise or prayer and meditation, etc. There's, there's all kinds of new thinking about this, a new experience experimentation, what I really think we need is a conference that brings together all the different jails and jailers who are rethinking how jail can be fashioned, particularly for folks whose whose main problem is addiction, not not that they murdered somebody or if they by the time they murdered somebody it's too late you're going to go to prison and that's where you belong um but uh but but i think that 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 it, it you're, it's a very it's a fascinating thing to watch because we've never thought of jail that way i've been a crime reporter 35 years never really thought that jail could be done any other way until the last six or eight years i've been watching these things begin to take to take um, uh, place. One of the things in Kenton County they do is they hired a social worker to sign people up for Medicaid a month before they leave so that they, by the time they're out, they have access to health care. They have access to dental care, which is really big if you're trying to get into trying to leave dope behind to have some some attempt at getting new teeth, a bit better smile feels better, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's there's it's a fascinating world and we need to rethink jail entirely. It's too, too important um a, a, a problem it can create too many problems for us as it has up to now for decades um but i also think it can be part of of a, a really fascinating solution too uh, a lot of things need to happen political will needs to be there you need to hire the right people etc but i think it's 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 a remarkable uh, thing and if you, you you just read the three chapters in, in 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 the book to get an idea of what is possible but there's a whole lot more going on out there about this I mean, maybe to follow up on that, I mean, you know, and maybe in a, in, in a, in a hopeful vein, are there other, you know, in addition to that, are there other policies or, or types of programs that you think might be particularly effective, you know, particularly at, or especially those that can maybe scale? Um, you know, I, I don't, the, the fact being on the street that you need to get people off the street and they can't and to a place where they can't go and they can't leave so you get them into treatment they leave treatment that's what the tent encampments are all about come on back come on back it's like tent encampments are all about they're they're like like that that the the, the tv show cheers you know it's like a place where everybody knows here's the it's the tent encampment where everybody knows your nickname you know everyone's into dope everyone's doing it you have to move people out of that that has to happen that the drugs aren't messing around this is not like you get a second chance. This is not what you do. the luxury that we had five years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. Of saying, "Well, we'll do this." No, you got to get people off the street. I don't see a lot of other ways of doing that. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I wish I did. I wish I saw ways in which they, you could just kind of uh, be part. You know, it, it, but I don't. I don't see it. I really. I really don't. Now. Um, you know, you can use like uh, safe injection sites or drug consumption sites or whatever they want to call them. Fine. I don't think we should be saying no to anything right now, honestly. The problem with that is that that leaves people on the street to use and these drugs are, are not kidding around. So that that assumes that every time that person uses, that person's going to use at your safe injection site. Right. And I doubt that very very strongly. I, I think those sites need to be measured. I'm sure they will revive a lot of people. There's no doubt, given the trucks on the street, you would be, you have Narcan right here. You have eight doses of Narcan per person. You're going to revive some folks. That's great. The, that should not be the measurement of those, of the, of the effectiveness. The effectiveness needs to be on, uh, uh, measured by how many people you get into treatment and how many people stay. That's where the effectiveness of those sites, because the longer they're on the streets to use fentanyl-based products, the, the more chance they're gonna be away and they're gonna, they're gonna die. And that doesn't even deal with the issue of methamphetamine. 
methamphetamine driving people mad. What do you, there's no MAT for that, methamphetamine assisted treatment for that. There's, you know, it's just, you need to get, separation is the only way you can get, begin treatment for, meth, for methamphetamine. Hence my feeling that this is, this is the only, right now, I, I don't give them the drugs on the street, you know, if those change, then my opinion might change, you know, facts change, my opinion change, but right now that's what I see. Okay. Uh, and maybe actually two, two questions kind of circling back a little bit to this question about, um, you know, the potency of both fentanyl and methamphetamines, you know, I guess, uh, again, a kind of a two-parter, to what extent do you think that this, or how has this sort of changed some of the, the pathways into substance use and initiation? And maybe a related question about how, you know, to what extent do you think some of these, you know, the, the higher rates of overdose and death might be changing on the back end, how some of the suppliers are thinking about things? Well, I don't, I would say that the, the, the rate of overdose death is changing, may well, and for the better, be changing how Americans think about drug use. Uh, I read, a, uh, after the, the cadet thing that took place in Florida, uh, West Pointers down there, um, I read a, a, a whole long Reddit feed um, in which everyone was bemoaning the fact they could no longer use cocaine. Oh man, I used to love, you know, we can't even do that anymore, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, yeah, uh, I think you ought to be happy. This is a good thing, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's again, it's Americans learning to be free again. You know, it's the same way when we, we, we understand how our brains work and that we can use them, we can use that knowledge to actively work against the marketing of, of, of Pizza Hut, you know, and, um, and Starbucks Frappuccinos with, you know, 60% whatever fat and sugar and all that crap, you know, and, and, and gambling and all that stuff. Um, so I think that it, in its excess, you know, that, uh, that we may be creating an opportunity for again for education and prevention that's how i felt when i was writing dreamland i began to realize that my own decisions consumption decisions were part of this story i needed to re and so i stopped drinking sodas just stopped i don't drink them anymore i used to drink coca-cola fairly often i used to drink eat lots of junk food lots of candy snickers and cookies and m ms and all that so i stopped that too no more of that um, I never really ate a lot of, of burgers and stuff, but um, but anyway, the, the idea is that we once you understand how this all works, then it, 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 the feeling I've had is that you can then become a, a free American again, and we can we can start uh, uh, you know uh, uh, moving in that way, and maybe that's also what's happening with the drug supply. That there it is impossible to exaggerate the dangers. I know that 30 years ago, 50 years ago, there was a lot of exaggeration about, oh, this stuff, you know, all of those myths that we laughed at, that I laughed at when I was in seventh grade and college and all the rest, all of those myths have become reality. You know, you can die from one hit of heroin, you can be driven mad by methamphetamine, you can go, you can die from a hit, a line of cocaine. And, and so it may be that we're creating, I, I think it would be very healthy this ability of Americans to say, I want to be free again. Now it's not free from tyranny in a political sense. It's the, it's the, the, uh, the, the oppression of endless marketing and endless availability in every store we go into of, of stuff. And on the street, endless availability of stuff that will, that not is reputed to be bad for you. It, it absolutely will kill you, you know? So maybe that's, I don't know. To me, that's 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 one thing I think is actually fairly, you know, positive about all this. Capitalism has created its own excesses and we're like learning how we can be free of it. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, actually, maybe a, a, a quick one. You had mentioned the, the book, uh, the, the Embrace uh, Walking book. Can you maybe mention that title again? We had a question about that. Uh, yeah. In Praise of Walking in by time. Sean O'Mara. Now I've just started it. I'm about 20, 30 pages into it. But again, he's it's a neuro he's a neuroscientist talking about how walking is good for you. And 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 again, you know, when you get into it, you think about the best medicine of all. The stuff that has kept us alive is is exercise, is walking, is movement. Movement is medicine, you know, motion is the medicine, that kind of thing. Um, all of that is so, so important. And it's what, you know, I think you can 
you can root a lot of what we're facing as a society in our lack of that. And so it's finding ways of moving more, finding ways of getting outside more, getting with other people, other Americans and having kind of life become, you know, a little bit more than what our bodies evolved to be. Had our, our bodies evolved to, and we, we, um, we uh, survived well by sitting in one place and looking at a wall for you know hours and hours and hours a day it may and then maybe we'd be in a great place today we didn't we 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 survived by being nimble by being mo mobile and with mobility comes all these changes in our brain and our bodies and our health and so on and so in praise of walking now I'm, I, I i haven't read the whole thing i'm only again i just started it uh, a couple of nights ago uh but but um uh, shane omar i think he's irish Great, thanks. Um, a question, Matt, can you maybe talk a little bit about, about stigma surrounding addiction, you know, in particular about, you know, how that might contribute to uh, barriers to treatment or even barriers to, to policies? Well, I, I think that's very much the case, of course. It's been the case for, I don't know, a long time, decades, of course. Um, and just how we view, I would say this, though. I have to say this, that I, because, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I lived this night and day. When I was writing Dreamland, the stuff we were talking about today was not even, that's only eight years ago, right? It's a remarkable transformation. Now naloxone, everyone knows what Narcan is, you know, um, and, and, and opioids. Now, I, I, as I said, I put opiate on it because nobody knew. Now everybody uses it commonly. And so it's, and, and what's more, the degree of separation because of that awareness, because people have come out of the shadows, because um, of all those lawsuits, uh, none of this existed when I was writing Dreamland, I can tell you that. I lived this, it's been a stunning change in my life. So people say, well, we have so much to change about stigma. And I say, yeah, but you know what? We have come an enormous distance, an enormous distance since I turned my manuscript in for that book. I'm not kidding, man. It was just, it has just been amazing to me, the stuff that's being discussed and made possible and made possible because the degree of separation is now known to be about two in many places, I would say. It used to be, I thought, six. You were like separated by six uh, between you and the la latest overdose death. And now I don't think that's true. I just think people are too vocal about it, too aware of it. And that is breaking down though that stigma. So yes, there has been this, but I would say the more, I'm, maybe I'm just biased. I'm a journalist, I'm a storyteller uh, by profession. And I just believe in the enormous power of storytelling. We have always, it's one of those things we have always needed. Why? Because we need community connection. Storytelling is a way of connecting us with other people in a tremendously profound way. And so maybe it's just because I'm a journalist and so I, I, this is my job, my living. Um, but I basically believe that that is really um, um, an essential part of, 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 of our lives. Uh, and, and, and so I believe, and I think storytelling is, it, it, once the more, the more storytelling we do, the more you, come to an understanding um, of how you're not alone or how other people or empathy um, very important for that to happen um, so you know i don't know to me storytelling is is like this immense potent tool has been forever forever you know we saw we've seen it now people aren't reading as much but you know you have some amazing stories told on television nowadays and and um so it's just kind of part of where we are, I think. Actually, one one sort of quick follow up to that. You, you mentioned some about the, the lawsuits. I know a lot of your work has been focused on the illicit side of things. Can you maybe talk a little bit about your reaction to, you know, some of the lawsuits that have been going on? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I can tell you I'm stunned. I am totally stunned. The amounts of money that are being pried loose, dislodged from these companies is just I never, ever, ever thought it possible. Because, again, when I was writing Dreamland, Nobody was talking about this stuff. Nobody. You couldn't. I mean, I was I remember walking around this one neighborhood in southern Ohio thinking a lot of people massively affected by Oxycontin addiction. And I was thinking the, the Sacklers are too powerful. The 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 um, the uh, 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 um, 
uh, uh, Purdue Pharma is too, too powerful. They're too much money. These are massive companies. There's no way they're, you know, and that's what I found when I was writing Dreamline. And then the book comes out and a lot of that just begins to change within months. I mean, it was a remark. It was a remarkable four years, my wife and I, until around about the time that COVID hit, I, I did, you know, in that time period, I just couldn't believe it. And so I just was like reluctant to ever say no to anybody who wanted me to come speak. I ended up doing literally, this is going to seem absurd, of course, but I ended up doing a, 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 in between September of 2015 and February of 2020, I did 265 speeches. You know, that's a ridiculous amount of speaking. But I, I remembered what it was like walking through that neighborhood when it didn't seem anybody cared about this story my wife and daughter were the, my only backup you know and i was thinking this is a national story nobody cares about it nobody doing anything about it and now everybody wants to know more about it i can't not i can't say no you know and so i didn't uh, very often um and, and so to me that's that's to, to watch those lawsuits, there were three, as I said, three lawsuits when I turned my manuscript in. Within a couple of years, it was 2,600. And then the great thing I thought from a journalist's point of view was that every attorney general in the country with subpoena power to dislodge all these records from these companies, now all of a sudden you can read unbelievable troves of, 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 of um, of documents right out of the emails and the memoranda and the board meeting minutes and all it's just incredible what you can see none of that did i have access to of course back then and i never thought i would ever would and now all of a sudden boom that's why two of the chapters in in the least of us based entirely on uh um the criminal complaints one from the state of tennessee the other from the state of massachusetts that just use all those documents man these things it's just fantastic you know so I'm just blown away that this is happening at all. Again, my own my perspective was being this lone voice out there in 2013, 14, wondering what I've done. I mean, I've signed my family up to write this book that nobody cares about, you know. And then it just radically changed. And so I watch these headlines about these lawsuits totally with that in mind. I'm like, God damn, this is incredible, man. I just remember the moments when I just never thought that would ever happen. Well, great. I think that I think that that's the most of the questions that, we, that we've got. Um, again, really want to thank you for taking the the, the time for this. Uh, can My certainly pleasure. give you a a virtual round of applause. I know from our audience <laughs> You're here. You're welcome. You're um, welcome. And, and people can contact me if they wish. I'm on my website. It's very easy to find sanquinones.com. There's a my my email, etc. And I'm on a, all the damn social media sites to have to be if you're a writer, I guess, these days. Joel, thank you so, so much, man, for doing this. It was really good of you. Um, you know, Paul's there somewhere. Anyway, thanks to you all. Really appreciated talking to you, even though I didn't see you. Um, hope you got a lot from it. And if you need to be in touch, you know how to do it. Okay, doke. Thank you so much. All right. Adios.